Good afternoon everyone and welcome to our uh, webinar today on the Ask ACNC sessions. This is the webinar version of the sessions that we ran around the country recently. Um, many of you may not have had the chance to come and see us face to face so we thought that this webinar would be a good opportunity for everyone to hear the um, presentations that were delivered around the country. Just a couple of notes before um, I hand over to Assistant Commissioner David Locke to begin. Um, just on the IT side of things, if you have any difficulties with the sound on your computer, try calling the phone number listed in the GoToWebinar control panel and there should be an access code that was um, given to you in the, the email upon registration. Also, um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so throughout the webinar. Just type it into the, the panel uh, or the question section on the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. It should be on the right hand side. Use the, the chat or, or the question box there. We will allow some time at the end of the presentation for um, uh, an interactive Q&A session. So if you've, if, you've got a few if you've got a couple of questions that you'd like answered then, um, put them in the, the chat box there and we'll, we'll see if we can get to them. Also, we, we will answer some questions by text um, directly and privately, um, but if we think the answers for some of those questions would be useful for everyone, we can respond in a way that allows all the attendees to see the question and the answer. But of course, importantly, not, not who asked the question. So just let us know if you would like your question answered privately in text. And just on the questions, we, we do suggest that you keep them general rather than being very specific or in any way that identifies your charity. Today's session is a general session on um, as an update about the, ASC, about the ACNC. So any, any questions specifically related to particular issues about your charity or, or particular aspects about things such as tax concessions or, or uh, registration applications or anything specific, it's probably um, uh, not the, the best format to try and answer those questions for you because you'll get a much better answer and a tailored answer if you either send us an email or give our friendly advice services staff a call on 132262. But having said that, we will try and do our best to get to all the questions we can. And finally, um, a recording of this session will be uploaded to our website and our YouTube page in the coming days. So if you um, uh, uh, did miss out a little bit or, or didn't quite get the details of a couple of um, slides or, or website addresses, don't fear. You can have a look at the, um, the session again online later. And once it is online, we will send out a follow-up email to all who registered to let them know that it's, it's available to have a look at. If you have any suggestions about our webinar program in general, um, feel free to send us an email too. We're always looking to improve the program and we'd like to hear your thoughts. Okay, so having, having um, gotten the admin stuff out of the way, I'd like to pass over to Assistant Commissioner David Locke who will take you through the Ask ACNC webinar session. Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk to you today uh, and to give you some information about the work that we've been doing at the ACNC and how this in particular uh, impacts on charities. Uh, what I'd also like to do today is to talk about the individual obligations that charities have in respect of the ACNC. So I'll certainly run through those, and if people have got questions on any of that, we're more than happy to, to answer those today. And then thirdly, what I'm going to do is to talk a bit about the data that we've got on the charity sector uh, and really um, give you a little bit of analysis of that. Um, we have further data that will be coming out later in the year and I'll talk about that as well. So firstly, um, what I'd like to do is just um, uh, point out the objects of the Act. So the ACNC was established, as you'll probably be aware, in December 2012, and we were given three objects by Parliament. The first one is to maintain, protect and promote uh, public trust and confidence in the not-for-profit sector. Now public trust is important because it underpins charitable giving uh, and it also underpins volunteering. 
Australians are, are some of the most generous people on earth. Um, whenever there's international surveys of giving and volunteering, Australia always uh, comes out in one of the, the top five countries in the world. And what we know is that when there are natural disasters, whether at home or overseas, then the public give very generously. But we also know that it's important that uh, if there is misconduct or mismanagement or if there are rorts or scams that are going on in the sector, uh, that these are properly addressed. What we don't want to happen is for a small number of bad apples to taint the barrel for everybody. And if we look at any of the natural disasters that have happened in recent years, whether it's the Queensland floods, whether it's the bushfires, if we look at things that have happened overseas, such as the Nepal earthquake, uh, or more recently, the, the terrible um, uh, tornado that's affected Haiti, what we've seen following any of these disasters is that it actually brings out the very best in people. People give very generously. But at the same time, for a small number of opportunists, um, it also brings out the very worst. So with all of these scandals, we've actually seen uh, that there have been fake appeals that have been launched as well. We know from other international uh, regulators that, that, um, that this isn't a unique Australian issue. Uh, and what we want to do is ensure that the public continue to give generously to charities. So public trust and confidence is something that we're passionate about uh, and uh, we work very hard to try and maintain. Now, the second object we've got is about supporting the sector. Be very wary of bureaucrats who are coming to you saying that they're here to help. Um, I think the public are quite rightly sceptical when uh, government starts saying uh, our role really is just to support you. But we were given this object following a great deal of lobbying from the not-for-profit sector because what the not-for-profit sector said during the passage of the ACNC legislation was that they, they wanted a particular type of regulator. They wanted a regulator that recognized that most not-for-profits are run by uh, people who uh, act as volunteers on boards and that nobody sets up a charity or a not-for-profit to become an expert on charity law or to fill out forms to government. They actually wanted a regulator that understood the not-for-profit sector uh, and that valued the independence of the sector uh, and that produced materials and, and, and assisted people to do the very best job that they could. And what we know from our experience over the last a uh, few years is that the vast majority of people who are setting up and running not-for-profits are doing so for positive altruistic reasons and are trying to do their very best. So what that means is that uh, we, we place a great deal of emphasis on trying to help you to do the right thing and trying to help explain as simply as we possibly can what the obligations are for charities and that's why we've got this function. The Ask ACNC sessions that we've been running around the country and the, the webinar we're doing today and the other webinars and guidance we produce is very much designed to try and assist. And that's why we really do appreciate the opportunity today to hear from you uh, about things that you think would be helpful. The third object we were given was to contribute to red tape reduction. Now, again, this may seem rather counterintuitive. So we have federal government setting up a new regulator in order to reduce red tape. And we know that for many charities, actually the introduction of the ACNC, certainly at least in the early years, has increased red tape rather than reduced it. But the reason we were given this object was that over the last 20 years, there have been a number of national inquiries that have looked into the regulation of the not-for-profit sector. And what all of these concluded from the Industry Commission report through to the Productivity Commission report in 2010 was that the sector was sinking in regulation, that there was a high degree of duplication, uh, both in terms of reporting but also in terms of licensing uh, in respect of fundraising, uh, and that people were uh, struggling with this. 
that government departments, both federal and at state level, weren't sharing information in respect of not-for-profits. And charities and not-for-profits were saying that time and time again they had to provide the same information to different parts of government. The ACNC was established really to, to drive a national framework for not-for-profits. If we look at the corporate sector with the introduction of corporations law, not that long ago, what we found was that business was unwilling to tolerate a duplicative uh, reporting regime and that they were crying out really for some national harmonization. And this is very much what the ACNC uh, has been working to try and achieve. So if, for example, we look at the issue of fundraising, if you are a charity or a not-for-profit in Australia and you are operating nationally or you wish to fundraise nationally, then you should be getting fundraising licenses from all the states and territories apart from the Northern Territory, which does not have a licensing regime. Of course, the situation nowadays is that very often charities will fundraise over the internet or using social media. And certainly the view of a number of the large states is that actually if you're doing this, then you must have fundraising licenses uh, across the piece as well. There is not a nationally consistent approach to this. And what it means is that many charities either are not complying with the current framework, or if they are, then they're having to get licenses and file reports to numerous jurisdictions. So what we would like to see both in respect of fundraising, but also in respect of charities that are incorporated associations and are currently reporting to consumer affairs or fair trading, is to get to a situation where there is a single report uh, nationally that, that, that is provided and that satisfies the reporting requirements of all jurisdictions. We've had some progress in respect of this and on the 24th of May this year, um, we had legislation passed by the South Australian Parliament, which will come into effect on the 1st of January next year. This legislation will have the effect of switching off the need for a charities that are registered with the ACNC to have to obtain a fundraising license in South Australia. They'll simply notify the South Australian government that you intend to fundraise in South Australia or you're fundraising over the internet. And then the annual information statement that you provide to the ACNC will satisfy your reporting requirements in respect of that state. What their legislation also does is it means that charities that are incorporated associations registered with consumer affairs in South Australia uh, will no longer have to file an annual report to that department as well. So it will satisfy all the reporting uh, requirements in that jurisdiction. What we then had was on the 1st of June this year, similar legislation was passed in Tasmania, which has the effect of switching off the reporting to Tasmanian uh, Government Consumer Affairs Department for incorporated associations there. Um, and if you are not having to provide reports in respect of that, uh, uh, then you don't have to provide fundraising reports either. So straight away we have two states that have passed legislation which will have the effect of reducing red tape. And we're working very closely with a number of other jurisdictions to see how we can also make similar progress. I said that the ACNC was established in December 2012. Uh, then with the change of government in September uh, 2013, uh, the new government had a policy position which was to repeal the ACNC legislation uh, and to return the functions to the ATO and ASIC. And we know that that created a, a large degree of uncertainty for charities. Just to be clear, the, the government's position changed earlier this year and on the 4th of March we had the announcement uh, of the decision to retain uh, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. Uh, the repeal legislation has been withdrawn from Parliament uh, and there is now uh, support across the political spectrum for the retention of the ACNC, which does of course mean the arrangements that I'm talking about today um, should be uh, staying in force. 
So what has the ACNC been doing over the last few years? I've talked a bit about uh, red tape and I'm happy to answer questions on that or talk more about that as well. Well, firstly and foremost, um, we're the registrar of charities. So now we make the determinations about whether an organization is a charity or not at the Commonwealth level. Um, there are 54,000 charities uh, registered with the ACNC. Uh, that's one charity for about every 445 Australians. So it's a lot of organizations. Uh, and every day, uh, nine people somewhere in Australia wake up in the morning, have a cup of tea or coffee, and they decide they're going to set up a new charity today. So what we're seeing is a, a high number of um, new organizations applying to register as a charity on a regular basis. Now, what we don't do is just say, isn't that wonderful? What we need is more charities doing the same work as the existing 54,000. What we do actually do, if somebody is thinking about setting up a new charity, is say, uh, let's have a look at the register. Uh, let's have a look at what you're intending to do. Did you know there are already nine charities in the town that you're based working with the same people doing the same work and you could actually support one of those organizations. Now people have often got a, a range of motivations for setting up a new charity. Sometimes it's because a loved one has been impacted by a disease or because they've identified there's a gap and there's something that they want to do. Uh, normally it's because somebody wants to change something or they want to make the, their community better or they want to make the world a better place. We don't want to discourage people from actually doing something positive for the benefit of others. But there are other ways to do this rather than setting up a new charity. So you could, for example, give the funds to an existing charity on special purposes. You could even have a committee uh, that, that looks at how some of that money may be applied. You could set up a sub-fund with a community foundation. There are lots of ways that you can actually uh, do something positive and even fundraise um, for funds without necessarily setting up a new charity. So as well as nine new organizations applying to register each year, what we're seeing is a lot of charities are also winding up. Uh, and really what we want to an analyze is why is that. But as we were given an object to ensure that there's a sustainable sector and su support a sustainable sector, then really what we want to do is ensure that we have healthy, trusted charities that can continue. We think that a lot of people who are applying to set up new charities may have good intentions, but they don't realize necessarily how difficult it is to raise funds or, or what hard work it is actually to run an organization in the long term. I've talked a bit about the guidance and advice work that the ACNC does. We um, we think it's important that we um, try and provide uh, useful guidance uh, for people who are running organizations. Uh, we issued some guidance on Monday, which um, specifically relates to uh, fundraising, uh, and in particular, the tricky issue of dealing with vulnerable people. So how do you as a charity know um, that the person that you're approaching may be in vulnerable circumstances, what's the right thing to do really in those situations. We're working on guidance at the moment on reserves policies. So we, we know that many charities tell us that they have difficulties, for example, with funders uh, who are uh, maybe reluctant to give money if they see that the charity has got a certain amount of reserves. We think that actually unless you are able to build up reserves and have some reserves, uh, then uh, it's difficult to actually run your organization in a sustainable way into the long term. And so we're producing some guidance that we hope will assist charities with regard to that. So in addition to registering organizations uh, and also um, giving advice and guidance, uh, we've built the ACNC Charity Register and the annual information statements that each charity um, completes, on a, obviously on an annual basis, gets published on the Charity Register. And what we're seeing with the Charity Register is an increasing take-up. 
So we've already had about 1.6 million searches on the register, and that's increasing at the rate of about 20% per year. And we can see from our analytics that it's not only funders and uh, charities that are actually looking at this, but we know that members of the public increasingly are doing so as well. We also take compliance action where that is necessary. Uh, and uh, uh, we really reserve the compliance action for where there is serious misconduct or mismanagement. And we're working across jurisdictions to provide what we've called the charity passport, which is the ability to transfer the information that you provide through the annual information statements to any government agency that may need that. Uh, and that's so that charities themselves don't have to provide that information time and time again. Obviously, one of the main benefits for being registered and one of the main reasons that charities choose to register with the ACNC uh, is so that they can access Commonwealth tax benefits or can actually uh, apply for public funds. Um, but we think it's also a, an important badge of credibility. And one of the things that we will be launching in November is what we're calling the charity tick. So you'll see on this slide the current graphic that we're working on in respect of this. Uh, all registered charities will be able to go onto the portal, uh, the charity portal, which is what you use really to complete your annual information statement or to notify us of changes, and you'll be able to download what's called a JPEG of this. And the aim is that if charities wish, they can use this on their note paper, on their website, on grant applications. And really what it shows is that you're a charity registered with the ACNC, you're reporting and your information is available on the charity register, and you're complying with the, the minimum governance standards that you're required to comply with. And we're doing this because we hope that this will actually become a recognized marker by the public to show that you're a genuine charity, even if they haven't heard of you before, uh, and that people can give confidently. So I've talked about some of the things that we're doing. This slide really just shows some of the facts and figures. Um, so not only have we registered 9,000 charities, but you'll see we've actually removed from the register over 14,500. So the number, the 54,000, isn't really increasing. It's pretty static. Um, I mentioned compliance action. Well, the most serious thing that we can do is actually revoke a charity status. Um, and really what we've done in that situation, we've done 25 revocations following investigations. So it's not a large number. We're not uncovering uh, a huge amount of fraud, corruption, serious misconduct, mismanagement, when you think of the 54,000. But the cases that we have, where we have revoked, have been very serious, and they would have a, a significant detrimental impact either on the public or on public trust and confidence more generally. So charities produce, uh, file their annual information statements. We, we make the information available, as I've said, on the register. Uh, we also look at the data that you're providing. If we think there's errors, particularly with regard to the financial data, then we will get back to you. So last year we contacted 7,000 charities out of 46,000 to ask them to, to uh, rectify errors that we'd identified on their financial reporting. So please don't think that nobody looks at this. Um, we look at it as well as the public. Um, and you'll see on this slide as well, we've put details of some of the guidance that we've got uh, on our website. Do go and have a look at the publications page, have a look at the template section. Um, there's actually quite a lot of information available and we're constantly working on guidance. So we really do want to hear from you if there's things that you think we could usefully do. Now, our approach is if there's already good free guidance that's been produced by others, whether it's our community, uh, whether it's AICD, whether it's uh, you know, other organizations out there, we're happy if it's freely available and it's high quality to signpost people to that. Um, we often signpost charities to uh, Justice Connect. They have a not-for-profit law portal, which is very good, lots of really helpful information on that. Uh, but wherever this is freely available, we'll signpost you to that. But if you think that there are, there are gaps or things that we could usefully do that would help, we always want to hear from you with regard to that. So now a little bit about your obligations. 
Well, the main thing uh, that every charity has to do is continue to remain entitled to be registered as a charity. So, so what does that really uh, entail? Well, it entails running your organisation as a charity and complying with the five minimum uh, governance standards. Now, those governance standards uh, uh, are, are available on our website. Um, they're not terribly um, complicated. The first one is that you have to be a not-for-profit and you have to use your funds uh, uh, in furtherance of your charitable purposes. The second governance standard is that if you have members, uh, many of you may be in corporated associations or you may have a constitution where you've got members, in those circumstances you have to have some accountability to those members. You'd normally do that, for example, through having an AGM. Uh, the third governance standard is that you have to comply with all Australian laws. Um, and really what that's designed to do is ensure that charities don't get involved in, in serious criminal activity. It gives the ACNC as the regulator the ability to act if you have charities that are involved or complicit themselves in fraud or money laundering or, or other serious activity. What it's not about is minor transgressions such as uh, speeding fines and things like that. It's really about serious criminal offences. Um, the fourth governance standard is you need to ensure that your board members are, are, are able to act as board members. Um, so you should check that they're not um, uh, an undischarged bankrupt. Uh, you need to really ensure that they're not, dis they haven't been uh, removed as a director by the ACNC commissioner or, or by ASIC, the company's regulator. Um, we do, under our template section, actually have um, a template form that you can ask new board members if you wish to, um, to complete to effectively certify that they're not disqualified from acting. And then the fifth governance standard is really about the duties that the board members uh, have. And they include such things as acting with due care and diligence, uh, properly disclosing conflicts of interest, uh, not misusing any of the assets of the charity or information that's obtained from the charity. Uh, so these are all things that, that your organization should be doing. If you are a company limited by guarantee uh, and you are continuing to comply with the corporation standards that were in place before the ACNC, uh, then you should have no difficulty with this. Similarly, if you're an incorporated association also registered with Fair Trading or Consumer Affairs and you're complying with the, the obligations there, then, then very much uh, they mirror these sorts of obligations. Um, so moving on, uh, if you um, want to uh, check whether you're up to date and whether there's uh, uh, you're complying with everything that you need to comply with. We have produced what we call a health check. Um, it's really an online questionnaire you go through. It'll prompt you and ask you various questions uh, and then it'll identify if there's any gaps or things that you need to work on and it'll signpost you really through to guidance or tools that we've developed to try and help with that. So I would recommend that to people. One of the big problems we find is that charities don't always tell us when there's a change in their circumstances. And there's some key things that we do need you to notify us of. So if your name changes, we need to know. Very importantly, the address for service. And this is the, the contact details we have for your charity. Now, particularly with small charities, this may be a board member whose details are given. And it could be that your board changes on an annual basis at the AGM. It's really important that this is up to date. Um, otherwise, we won't know and we'll continue sending correspondence to the email address or postal address that we've got before. And a lot of the challenges we have are where charities have moved and, and forgot to tell us. If your board members change, then you need to update this information. And if you change your governing rules, your governing documents, as we often call them, whether it's your constitution or your memorandum and articles of association, um, you need to upload a copy of that. Now, if you're registered with Fair Trading or Consumer Affairs, there'll be requirements that you have with them in terms of filing and, 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 and notifying them, sometimes even getting consent. You do that first, and then you just file with us uh, the document uh, that you've done there. But this is pretty important to us. 
When will the ACNC revoke registration? Well, we don't wake up in the morning thinking, what charities can we revoke today? It's something we do very reluctantly. Um, but we will take that action if an organization is no longer entitled to registration, so it's not a charity. We have had situations where, you know, over 20-year period, things have changed. It may have started out as an aged care facility, but over time it's become a hotel. Um, in those circumstances, clearly it's no longer charitable. Uh, we will take, uh, we take very seriously if false information is provided to the ACNC. Now, not if this is unintentional, um, but if people are not being honest with us, it, it's a legal obligation that you provide um, honest information to us and you, you comply with reasonable requests for information. So we do take action there. If there's serious non-compliance with the Act or regulations, we also will take action if charities fail to file their annual information statements. So where charities have failed to file two years in a row, we've been revoking those charities. Uh, and even organizations that persistently fail to file in one year, we are, have uh, this week for the very first time uh, issued a number of penalty fines on charities. Uh, we've actually issued 41 penalty fines. Now these can be significant. Uh, again, we will always be contacting organizations with reminders, we will give notices, but at the end of the day you do have a legal obligation to file the annual information statement. Uh, similarly, we'll revoke if a charity has wound up, for example, and requests a voluntary revocation or if it has gone into uh, insolvency. In terms of the annual information statement, this has to be filed every year. Every charity has to do this, apart from some very limited exceptions, such as uh, charities that may be indigenous corporations registered with the Office for the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations. In those circumstances, we take the information from them. But all of the charities need to do an annual information statement. You have six months from the end of your financial year to do this. So if you have a financial year of the 30th of June, you have until the 31st of December. Although we're, we're generous, we give everybody till the 31st of January. We don't want people doing this on, on New Year's Eve. Uh, although when I was in the Gold Coast, I did have a lady uh, at the session that I was running there who actually said she always likes to do this on Christmas Eve. I would encourage you not to do this on Christmas Eve, to spend time with your family or to make some mince pies or something, um, but you, you have until the 31st of January. If your financial year is the 31st of December, then again you'll have until the 30th of June each year uh, in which to file your annual information statement. Uh, again the slide says please tell us if you move or if you change your contact details, it is very important to us, otherwise we're constantly sending reminders to old addresses and you won't actually get to hear uh, if there's something that's missing or something that you need to address. So now uh, finally I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the information we have uh, on the charity sector. So. With charities filing their annual information statements, not only are we able to publish this information, but we have, for the very first time, almost a census, really, of the charity sector in Australia. And the figures that I've got here are the figures from the 2014 annual information statement. What we can see is, of the 54,000 registered charities we have, uh, registered with the ACNC, that the total income of those organizations is actually much more than we'd ever known. It's actually $122.6 billion. Now that is significant, it's a very significant proportion of GDP. That is actually more than tourism in Australia, it's more than agriculture, farming and fisheries combined. So not only are charities important in terms of the social fabric, of the country and in terms of the impact that you make in your community, but also economically important in terms of the government. And we, and we think that this is important data that, that bureaucrats and uh, uh, politicians uh, should be aware of as well when they're forming uh, public policy. So that's the total figure, but what we see is that the distribution of that is by no means equal. So the largest 5% of charities actually receive about 80% of the sector's income. We have billion dollar charities in Australia, including some of the um, world renowned universities that we have, but also uh, very large service providers as well. Um, but actually, 
Um, what we also have is a very large number of small organizations. So those of you who are from uh, small charities will probably recognize this. 31.5% of all charities actually have an annual income of less than $50,000 a year. Um, so although 5% of charities have got 80% of the sector's income, 80% of charities have actually got 5% of the income. When we look at size, you'll see there the classifications are based upon the thresholds in our legislation. So small is charities with an annual uh, income less than $250,000 a year. Medium is $250,000 to $1 million a year. And the large charities, large is actually classified as any charity with an income over $1 million a year. You'll see 64% are small. Um, some of you may be DGR charities, what's called deductible gift recipient status, and what that means is that if I give uh, $10 or $100 uh, to your charity, then when I do my annual tax return to the ATO, I can offset that donation against my tax liability. And of course, this is important for many charities that want to raise funds from the public. Actually, what you'll see is only 40% of charities have DGR status. It's a, it's a complicated uh, uh, framework uh, around DGR, uh, and it, it is difficult. Uh, many organizations don't fit within those criteria. Now, we do have information specifically on DGR. We've got fact sheets. We've got links through to the ATO uh, already on our website. We are running a, a joint webinar with the ATO on tax concessions early in the new year. We did one in, I think, about July this year, and there is a video of that on the website as well. If you've got particular issues with regard to tax, obviously we can try and help you or we can steer you to the right people at the ATO who can assist. There is a dedicated helpline at the ATO specifically for not-for-profits, and we can give you that number um, rather than you having to go through the general ATO contact number as well. Not only uh, is there a diverse distribution with regard to the, the income and assets of the sector, though, what this slide shows is that there's no one activity. We can see that the largest group uh, 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 is religion, faith-based organizations, actually comprise 30% of the charities on the register. And we now have a significant amount of data that shows the contribution that faith organizations make uh, in Australia. But there are also charities from a whole range of different groups as well, as you can see here. What we know is that charities employ over a million people. That's about 9.8% of the Australian workforce. So very significant uh, employer. Uh, but what we also know is that there are over 2 million volunteers in charities. Now, when we look at not-for-profits more generally, so not just charities, but also all the not-for-profit sports clubs, and there's, of course, millions of those, um, we look at professional associations and social clubs, then actually the Australian Bureau of Statistics figure with regard to volunteers is closer to 6 million. But in terms of charities, it's about a million staff and about 2.1 million volunteers. What we can see is that 44% of charities actually have no paid staff at all. So entirely volunteer run, entirely uh, volunteer led. Four, four out of five charities do engage volunteers. And if you're interested in some of this data, what I would encourage you to do is to actually have a look uh, at the data set. So if you go to Australian Charities, um, at, at australiancharities.acnc.gov.au. So all one word, Australian Charities, and then .acnc.gov.au. You can you can actually have a look at the data that underpins this. So you can click by state or territory, or you can click by these categories in this slide to actually see a lot more information on this. What we will have in uh, early December this year is the data from the 2015 annual information statements. And again, all of that will be made available on that website and accessed through the ACNC website. And for the first time, we'll be able to see what changes may have happened uh, with regard to the sector over that 12-month period.
In addition to releasing uh, that report in early December, we will also in the new year be releasing two further reports. There's a report that, that the researchers are, work, are going to be working on on aged care organizations, which may be of interest to some of you. And there'll also be a report on small charities as well, where we're actually trying to uh, analyze in more detail uh, the small organizations and what that looks like. And that's the end of the formal presentations, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thanks very much, David. Um, <clears throat> yeah, keep the questions coming through if, you, if you've got some. We'll, we'll be happy to take some now in a, in a sort of interactive Q&A, even though um, none of us can see each other. We'll, we'll do our best and, and hopefully we can get to, to your question as well. A couple that we might jump on early, David, if you don't mind. You mentioned... Um, the importance of keeping an address for service up to date. That there are a couple of queries about um, uh, where organisations might not even know if their address for service is currently out of date or if we've got the wrong one. Are they missing stuff? How, how would they know um, to, that they need to update it with us? So well, what I would encourage you to do is to actually have a look at the register. So if you go to the charity register you can, either, you can do it one of two ways. You can just go to the public register. So if you go to acnc.gov.au and then you click on uh, find a charity and you put your charity's name in or you put your ABN number in there, then it will pull up the register entry and you'll be able to see from that the, the contact uh, details that we've got. If that's not correct, then if you go into the charity portal, then you can just change those details yourself. Once you've clicked on that and made the change, it will immediately pre-populate the, the website. So have a look at that. If you've got the password for your charity, um, then you can go into the portal and just make those changes yourself. If you haven't, then you can reset the password if we've got your details as one of the uh, board members or what we call responsible persons of the charity, then you can do automatically reset that through the website. But any difficulties, just give us a call. There's a nice little segue into the next question. We had a couple come through about um, the role of, well, as we call them, responsible persons, but this may be um, for a charity's uh, committee member or board member. Just um, on the the obligation to keep things up to date in the portal and to fill in an annual information statement, are there any prescriptions on who must be doing this or, or which pe people within the charity board or the responsible persons need to be doing this? Well, ultimately with every charity, it's the board members who are responsible really for the, for the, the leadership of the organisation and responsible for, for, for the management. Now, of course, that may but well be delegated and particularly it will be delegated if you've got staff uh, and large charities will have a whole series of sort of formal delegations. Um, we, we don't mind who does this as long as they're authorised by the charity to do this on, on their behalf. Um, so it's really the question, it's a good question though for board members to check the register and to check at board meetings that actually the reporting is up to date. We don't want to get to a situation where we're issuing a $4,500 fine on a charity and we've actually sent dozens of reminders and phoned them and spoken to people and actually the board are not aware of that. So I think as a board member, whatever the size of your organisation, you want to ensure that your charity is um, compliant with the reporting requirements. Um, in terms of the duties of responsible persons or uh, the obligations on responsible persons or board members, um, there is a, a guide that we produced, um, particularly for small to medium charities, but it, 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 it's called Governance for Good, and we really designed that for board members. So if board members read nothing else, um, uh, and particularly it's useful, I think, if you've got new board members coming on board, we would encourage you to give them a copy of Governance for Good and get them to read that, which does set out both the governance standards uh, and it also sets out as well um, what the obligations are. And just on that one, I might add that a couple of webinars ago, I think it was, we did a, a, a thorough overview of the roles of responsible persons too. So if you if you go to the webinars page on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars, you'll be able to see a copy of that webinar, a, 
a copy of the presentation. So you'll be able to watch the whole video and even download the slides um, separately to get a good overview of the roles of responsible persons in addition to having a copy of the guide governance for good. Another one, uh, David, just on the uh, reporting obligations, um, there's a, a little bit of anxiety, I guess, in a couple of questions regarding missing the due date. So you mentioned that charities have to submit an annual information statement within six months of the end of their reporting period. A few questions have come through about missing that deadline and, 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 and I guess um, some fears about um, being, being lumped with a fine almost immediately have, after having, having um, missed their six month deadline. So we will always contact people at, after the deadline if they've failed to comply. Um, and the situation where we're now levying fines is where people have had a number of reminders and also had a formal notice telling them that they have to file by a particular date or they will get a fine. Um, it, it is important though that, you, that you're aware of the deadline. If you're in a situation where you, you've actually missed the deadline and you haven't filed, don't panic, just do it now. Um, that's our advice. We're not setting out trying to find people. We're really, it's where, it's where we've got to the situation where we feel there's no more resort really. We've spoken to the charity, we've sent them the notices, they still haven't filed. We've told them that they have to file by this date, they still haven't filed. Um, so you do have six months from your year end. Often, particularly if you have an AGM and, and uh, things are, are settled there or the accounts uh, for a larger organization are audited or reviewed, then once that's done, why not file then? So what I would say to people is don't leave it till the last minute. Um, do it when you're in a position to do so and, and get into a bit of a habit of, uh, of doing it then. You've got six months from your year end. If you're in real difficulty and there's an issue, for example, with the auditor, then give us a call. Let us know. We can, in certain circumstances, grant exten extensions of time. Um, if there's something beyond your control. Um, but if you've missed it and you're panicking now, don't panic, just do it straight away. That's some good advice. Um, yeah, our, our advice services team um, on the phones often get, get questions um, from charities that, that may have missed the deadline about what should they do. And then as David points out, the, the standard piece of advice in that situation is don't call us, just do it now, submit it now, and then try and um, put it into, into your charity's practice to get it done on time every year. So if you've already done it, and even though you did it late, we're not going to be issuing fines. So don't feel as though, if, if I now, I'm now eight months late, if I now do it, I'm going to get a fine. That, that's not how it works. We'll issue a fine when actually you still haven't done it and we've given you reminders to do it. So if you haven't done it, um, don't panic, just do it now uh, and that'll be fine. Just next year, try and do it within the period. Some good advice. Um, okay, we may as well touch on this one. We won't, we can't. We I might just preface it by saying we can't go into it in too much detail because of the complexity of it and the um, and it, it generally depends on the details of every charity. But there are a few questions about tax concessions, David. So the most common one, um, I guess you'll be able to predict, is regarding DGR. You did mention it in the presentation, but would you be able to just give us a, a very broad overview of, of how it works? I think there may be some misconception about DGR and, and all charities possibly being eligible for DGR and that sort of thing. But um, without, without necessarily going into too much detail, could you just give us one more brief overview of, of the connection to tax concessions and charity registration? Okay, so, the, so the, the, there's about 25,000 organisations, 25 to 27,000 organisations that actually have DGR status. Most of these are charities, although there are some not-for-profits that, that do have DGR status that are not charities, but the vast majority are charities. If we look at the, the categories that, that the majority of those fall into, many of them will be what's called public benevolent institutions. So to be a public benevolent institution, you, you actually have to um, be really delivering benevolent or involved in the delivery of benevolent services to the public. And that, that might be something, for example, uh, such as a, you know, a soup kitchen, for example, classically. Um, uh, other types of uh, charity that can get DGR status, health promotion charities can get DGR status. And then there are other categories of organisation as well. So there's a number of different schedules which really set out. So for example, 
uh, hospitals carried on by a society or association and you know animal welfare organizations a public university uh, a school building fund um, what's called a necessitous circumstances fund um, a, a charity that's involved in overseas aid uh, scholarship funds um, so you see there's a, there's a number of organizations that a number of different categories in which your organization may be able to fall but there's different criteria that are apply in respect of each of those category so it, it is complicated and it, it isn't the case that just because you're a charity and you're doing good work that you will be eligible for DGR that the, the categories are actually quite difficult what the ACNC's role is is it decides whether your organization is a charity or not um, now, in some circumstances, such as if you're a public benevolent institution or a health promotion charity, then, then you know, that's likely to be a, a significant prerequisite to getting your, your DGR status. So, um, but in other situations, you know, it's just the first step, and it's really the ATO that will determine whether you're entitled to DGR endorsement or not. So if you um, have queries with regard to that, the dedicated helpline at the ATO, the telephone number is actually 1300-130-248. I'll, I'll give that again. 1300-130-248. And you can give them a call and, and have a look through. We have a fact sheet on our website, which is Deductible Gift Recipients, DGR and the ACNC. Um, and we also link through to ATO resources, Can You Be Endorsed as a DGR, uh, is the fact sheet. But you'll find that from uh, our website. So if you go on our website, uh, acnc.gov.au, and you go under Manage, Manage My Charity, and then under Fact Sheets, uh, you, or you'll find it. Um, uh, it's clearly there. Thanks, David. That, that is a pretty popular one, and it is worth taking the time to just read through some of that information and understand it, because um, we've discovered, as this webinar with some of the questions and, and previous webinars have, have shown, that there's a, a little bit of miscon uh, misconception about the, the role of tax concessions with ACNC registration. And we know it is very complicated. Um, it is, it, it's ultimately up to Federal Treasury to determine, obviously, the, the, you know, the tax policy of the country and how these policies uh, apply. We work closely with the ATO and Treasury and we do communicate the difficulty that charities have in understanding the current framework and, and the, the problems with the complexity that the current system has. But ultimately that, that's a matter outside our control. We've probably got time for a couple more. Let's, let's um, change uh, tact a little bit from something um, so complex and involved to something a little bit a little bit simpler. We've got a few questions about people having um, uh, trouble logging in to, to update their details and, and can submit their annual information statement simply because the previous board or committee or treasurer didn't leave any handover notes and the, the password's gone missing and, and no one knows what to do. Um, I guess the question is twofold. What do you recommend charities should do to be able to to, to get on top of that and secondly the practical element how do they actually do that if they don't have a password anymore what should they do well as I said if you if you are if you are already a board member then you should be able to go onto the website and reset your password if you're not currently a, if you're not currently on there as one of the responsible persons uh, of the charity um, then you'll need to give us a call and and we'll send you a form that or point you to a form that you can fill out so we might, for example, just want confirmation um, of when the board changed and then um, if you complete the form, we can then actually reset the password. Um, but normally, if you're on there as a board member of a charity, then if you actually go to the portal page, you'll see under the login, there is a section that says reset your password. You can actually click on that and it follows you through a four-stage process and it will reset the password. So we can do that because we've already got your information and we already know your address and date of birth and things like that. So we can we can automatically the system can process and and, and see that you are who you say you are and we can issue that. Um, but beyond that, you can always give us a call and we'll we'll help you. 
Uh, and how about charities that have a high turnover of um, staff, or not staff, I mean um, responsible persons, board members and committee members. Do you have any recommendations for, for them in, in keeping on top of this sort of administrative stuff? Well, the, my advice would re be really go to the portal um, and update the information. You, you add or remove the board members as they change. So once you, once you keep your password in a safe place, and then once you've got that, you can go on, and it's quite easy to do. You're supposed to notify us of changes to the board. Um, if, you're a, if you're a large charity, then you have 28 days in which to do that, if you're medium or large. Uh, if you're a small charity, so that's a revenue under $250,000 a year, then you have 60 days in which to do that. So you are supposed to do it pretty soon after the changes, really. And actually, you'll find it much easier if you do it uh, then. Look, if you, if you haven't done it and the information's up to date, again, don't panic. You know, we're not going to come down on you like a, a, a ton of bricks. We're not a, um, we're not a gotcha regulator. Uh, just do it when you become aware or do it when you do your annual information statement. So if you, if you, if you haven't done it to date, don't panic. Just, just do it as soon as you can. Probably time for one final one before we wrap things up. Um, and of course, if, if, if you haven't had your, your question answered, or if, you, if something pops into your mind a little bit later, feel free to send us an email and we'll get in touch with you. But the, the last one that we'll cover um, here in the, the webinar is just on, what well, touches on red tape reduction actually, because a couple of questions about people being confused about their reporting obligations. They, they receive a reminder letter from the ACNC and, and realise that they just submitted something to uh, their state regulator, whether that be Consumer Affairs or the Office of Fair Trading in some states it may be called. Um, so the, the question is, is, is the requirements of the ACNC in addition to the stuff that they've been doing at the state regulator for, for number, a number of years? It is at the moment, yes. Uh, and that's why I, when I was talking earlier, I talked about the increase in red tape. So if you are registered with fair trading or consumer affairs, then you, obviously you need to do your, your report to them on an annual basis. Um, but you also, at the moment, need to do the report to the ACNC as well. Um, now, with regard to the financial reports, if, you're, if you need to send financial reports, so if you're medium or large, you, you, you up, will upload the financial report that you're already giving to Fair Trading or Consumer Affairs. Um, but you all need to do the annual information statement as well. So that's charities that are registered at a state level. If you're actually a company limited by guarantee, uh, so you're registered with ASIC, you no longer have to file any reports to ASIC. So you do not have to notify ASIC if your directors change, nor do you have to file reports on an annual basis. The reporting to the ACNC satisfies those requirements. But at the moment, there is the double reporting to Consumer Affairs, Fair Trading, and to the ACNC. I mentioned the changes that are coming with South Australia and Tasmania, and we are hopeful that other states will follow suit as well and that it will switch off the reporting to Fair Trading Consumer Affairs for charities. But at the moment, it, there is still a duplication there. Great. Thanks, David. And of course, one of the things that does pop up in um, some of the responses we get on um, to reminder letters and whatnot is... is um, notification that people have already paid their fees to us. Yeah, there are no fees to the ACNC. Uh, there's no fees on, on lodging your annual information statement or notifying us of changes of your constitution or changes of your directors. So when people say to us, I've already done it because I've paid the fee, that is always consumer affairs or fair trading. It's not the ACNC. There is no fee to the ACNC. So, so Please make sure that it's been done here as well as uh, Fair Trade and Consumer Affairs. Otherwise, you will get the reminders, I'm afraid. Excellent. Well, I think that probably is all that um, we have time for today. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and, and um, making this session as successful as our face-to-face -face sessions around the country were. Had a great um, turnout for the webinar, although as a, a as I've already mentioned, none of us can see each other, so you just have to trust me that we've got a lot of people here. We look fantastic, by the way. No. <laughs> that part as well. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm sure everyone does. Um, make sure you do keep in touch with us, as you can see on your screen here still with the last slide. Um, we, we have regular um, columns uh, written by the Commissioner Susan Pascoe, which are released fortnightly, and email updates. So go to our website and uh, sign up to those updates. It's a really good source of information. And any, any of the sorts of changes that David has forecasted with regards to legislation and, and, and important um, developments with the ACNC is always mentioned in the email updates in the Commissioner's column, so it's worth getting um, signed up to those. Also, as David has mentioned, the, the guidance online. So we, we do um, these webinars um, regularly, once a month, and um, we will send out a follow-up email to this one, and, and it's worth keeping your eye on the upcoming webinars. Just on the next webinar, it's worth pointing out that we'll have a I guess we'll call it part two of the Ask ACNC session. We'll have, uh, when, we, when we went around um, the country and did the face-to-face -face sessions, the, the second part was um, some basic financial training for, for charities and, and that's about um, submitting the financial information as part of the annual information statement and being able to understand what elements are needed and, and, and how best to manage that in your charity. So that will be the focus of our next webinar in two weeks. It will be on Tuesday, October 25th at midday. So if you want to, if you didn't get a chance to go to our face-to-face -face webinar and you wanted to um, uh, take part in that session, I recommend getting online um, on the webinars page and signing up to that. The, the registration link will be available very soon and it will also be in the follow-up email that we send you following this, this webinar. And as um, we have mentioned a few times, if there's anything at all that you want to ask us about, no question is too silly. Some people would feel like they don't want to get on the phone because that it's not the right question to ask, but it's never the case. So get online, uh, sorry, get on the phone and, and call 132262 if there are any specific questions you have about your charity or your obligations or something you'd like to talk about. We've got um, highly trained, very friendly, educated staff on our advice services line who will be happy to help you between 9 and 6 p.m. And of course, their email address is advice at acnc.gov.au. And finally, we are very active on social media. So follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and check out our YouTube videos for um, lots of good information. I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We look forward to the next webinar, and thank you, David. Thank you, and have a great day, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you for the next webinar.